Uh, I want to talk to you about implementing game servers in Erlang and OTP because game servers are really interesting because they're kind of like telephone systems in that you have lots of people connected and they're all in the separate bubbles. Like in a telephone system, it's most like two people that talk. In the game, it's like four people per game. And you obviously want to isolate those bubbles. And Erlang is a perfect fit for that, naturally. And unlike the legacy telephone systems that exist, uh, we can use like web sockets and other cool stuff. And who am I? I'm a freelancer doing Elixir, Erlang, and Ruby. I began working with Erlang one and a half years ago and did Ruby and iPhone development before that. And one of the projects I've been working on is Sauspiel. That's the biggest online version of the popular German card game Schafkopf, which translated means sheep's head, but there are no sheep involved in the game. It's a card game. <laughs> so I took the definition from Wikipedia. It's a so-called trick-taking card game, meaning hands are dealt to players, followed by a finite series of rounds called tricks, which are each evaluated to determine a winner or taker of the trick. And at the end, you know the, who won the game. So this is the uh, game client. You see the people sitting at a table playing this game. And the company behind Sauspiel is uh, also the company behind three other sibling sites where you can play different traditional German card games. And so that's an uh, interesting uh, requirement for the game server because uh, we got four instances of this game server that, play, that runs different games. And another project I've worked on is Bold Poker. Where, so when you play poker, you have got the deal cards, and deal, dealing cards could be tedious. So why not get out your iPhones and use an Erlang server to deal cards for you? And that's a product, you can buy it, it works, it makes money. And yeah, uh, that's where the tagline is, deal with it. Um, that's what I talk, want to talk about today. First, I want to give you an eagle's eye overview of this whole system, then a deeper look into like the finite state machine that is one of those games. Uh, and then I just want to basically manually trace one in-game event through the processes it touches. And then uh, I'll talk about some real world concerns like people that reconnect and how we deal with that or when we deploy a new version and we uh, move people over to the new server. And then I'll talk about our plans on board poker and some Q&A. So this is the physical setup of one of those games. There's a clustered load balancer that gets the incoming connections and forwards them to whichever Erlang physical server is currently marked as active. And let's focus on one of those Erlang servers. There are, there are four OTP apps. So when you uh, do mix new dash dash umbrella, what happens is that mix creates for you a folder structure where you have different sub applications. And these are so-called OTP applications. They have dependencies between them, which means the Erlang VM can determine what the proper startup order is and the proper order to shut it down. So you need to have the storage application online before you can uh, have a card game. You need to have network uh, active and so on. And let's look at the card game OTP app. What the Erlang VM does when it starts, it is uh, it starts a supervisor. Like in the Learn You Some Erlang for Great Good book, I'm also using the same green for supervisors always. So this is the top supervisor process. It gets started by the VM. And it's a simple one-for-one -one supervisor, which means, means you can just tell it to like start me a new child with some arguments. And thank you. Uh, each of these children uh, is one of those table processors, and they are identified by a global identifier. There's support for that in the Erlang standard library. Like it's a tuple, table six, table seven, and so on. We got the network app, and uh, it uses Cowboy and Ranch. Cowboy and Ranch are third-party libraries. Plug, the Elixir uh, web uh, thingy, uses that. When an incoming connection gets terminated at this Erlang node, uh, Cowboy starts one separate process per incoming connection. Uh, we got uh, WebSocket connection handlers, basically. And since we have got a Flash client that uses a legacy protocol where it sends raw TCP and doesn't use uh, WebSockets, we use Ranch which is a socket acceptor pool library on which Cowboy builds 
to like deal with those uh, raw TCP connections. And the connection handler process gets the data from the socket, from the LMVM, and then uh, it uh, deserializes it and hands it further and presents a consistent API to the rest of the system. The storage app is also rather simple. It spawns a fixed sized pool of PostgreSQL workers and we've got the table ID sequence gen server that we use to get monotonically increasing table IDs. It talks to the database and says like, give me new IDs, give me new IDs and so on. And the game server OTP app is basically a grab bag where we put everything else that's like important. So the things that are grayed out uh, are like the leaks and the lobbies and stuff like that. And it also has a chi child supervisor, which is again simple one for one. So the player processes live uh, under that. And they are again globally registered. So within the whole Erlang cluster, you can always check whether or not a player process for player one exists. And yeah, when implementing a card game, it's really nice to have a finite state machine because that fits pretty well. And the Erlang standard library has a pretty great uh, finite state machine called Gen FSM. And so, as I said, you've got this table. There are four people sitting there, but in the beginning, there's one guy sitting there, then the next one arrives, and so on and so on. Once four are there, the game can start. And then uh, once it's done, it restarts until someone leaves. So I draw, drew this state diagram. Um, the, the challenge we had was because we've got lots of house rules that, in, uh, that, that lead to different uh, things that need to happen, and we got these four different games that are also completely kind of different. Uh, we needed to be able to customize that. We've got the outer state machine, which is a Gen FSM, which just uh, uh, flaps between idle and playing. So once four people are there, it goes into playing, and then it starts what we call stages, where, uh, which is basically a stack of modules that it uses as callback modules, like a Gen FSM has its own callback module. This thing again has more callback modules. Uh, where it forwards events and those modules then deal with them. So when it, trans, uh, when it transitions into uh, playing, it calls create stages for this uh, game settings and that returns uh, a list of uh, callback modules, each with some configuration. So that is for Schafkopf, it, st it starts with like dealing some cards, then everyone has like 5,000 uh, milliseconds to raise the bet, then again dealing some cards, then negotiation phase, and then there are uh, a lot of uh, play stages where everyone has to play a, a card and then so on until we've got the result. So when you send an event to a running Gen FSM process, the callback modules uh, function with the name of the current active state, state gets called. So that would be table.playing for us. And it gets the current uh, state uh, data for this, uh, sta for this, from this uh, process. And it can return a tuple with either next state and the next uh, state name and the new state data or stop if it wants to shut down. So that's like uh, idle and playing and then we've got the nested stages again. And what we did is we always look at the top of the stack of nested stages and we do the same as the Gen FSM. We call uh, the current state name on them like playing but we hand them also their own uh, their own state that we, uh, that we carry for them, like the Gen FSM carries our state uh, for the table. And we, we support a few more uh, return values, like the tuple next stage, which, po which pops the current stage uh, off the stack and goes to the next, or end game, which ends the game. There's also the function Gen server reply in the LXS standard library, which is interesting. It basically allows you to out of band reply to a, a call in a Gen server. And we did something similar for our table process. There's, for example, table broadcast event, which broadcasts an event to all players. So it starts with deal cards, then this is done, it goes into knocking, this is done, deal cards again, and so on. Then when an event uh, arrives, it looks, uh, do I handle that myself? For example, it handles stuff like people going offline or people requesting a pause of the game itself. And if not, it just forwards it to the current stage to do whatever. So following an in-game game event through the system, there are two things to keep in mind. Uh, so these are all the processes involved. We've got the table FSM, and it communicates with these four player processes, P1, P2, P3, P4, and each of them communicates to a connection handler process. 
but these connection handler processes don't, they aren't actually the web socket. The actual socket is this Erlang port, which is what the Erlang VM gives you when you have a network socket, and it behaves mostly like an Erlang process. You can send it messages, and these messages then get sent over the network, and when data arrives at the socket, the port sends the, its so-called controlling process a message with like, hey, there's data here, do stuff. And secondly, uh, if you remember the OTP apps from before, uh, all these processes live in different OTP apps, which means their supervisors are different, but they still can communicate without issues. So uh, the table is in a state uh, where someone has to play a card. So it sends this tuple game event must play card to the uh, player process that has to play the card. And once arrived there, the player process uh, sends it to the connection handler. The connection handler process knows I'm a WebSocket, I speak JSON, so let's serialize that. It sends it through this protocol JSON.write method that we have that spits out a JSON string, and then uh, it sends it down the socket. The player process also stores the event so that when later a player reconnects, it can do that again, but I'll talk about that later. So the message arrives at the client, the client does something, updates the UI, waits for the player to play a card, sends back some JSON. It arrives at the connection handler. The connection handler calls uh, protocol JSON pass and gets back a tuple. This is really awesome, I think. Like decoding this stuff at the uh, farthest border of the system makes it easy because then within the system, we only got like Elixir data structures, like tuples and stuff, where we can really uh, easily pattern match on them and so on and we don't have like strings of JSON that we send around. So, and we had in the past, for example, protocol XML, and so we could support uh, flash clients that did XML, which we had, but then we were like, XML is horrible, let's use JSON and throw that away. <laughs> so then the player process knows I'm playing at table number nine, so let's forward this event to the table, the table forwards it again to the current stage, and so on and so forth. Two things to keep in mind in the real world is like, as I said, uh, people might get angry during the game and mash the keyboard and hit F5 and the browser reconnects and then the browser closes the WebSocket connection. Stuff happens. Also, we've got this one server on which it all fits, which is really good because it's uh, nice to deploy and stuff. But what if we need to do a kernel upgrade and we can't really do that ever because people are playing 24 seven and you don't want them to be like, oh wait, we are rebooting now, you can't play for 10 minutes. So we need to figure out something for that too. Also the same for rolling out new code. We both do like hot code swapping and just starting a new server, moving people over and having them play there. So first, when a user disconnects, at first the port closes down because the WebSocket connection is gone. Then the connection handler finds out about that and is like, okay, I'm gone too. Then the player process finds out about that because it monitors the connection handler and usually the player process now would shut down because what do you need a player that's just in the lobby when the player is disconnected? But because the player process knows that it's currently playing at this table, it can't shut down. Instead, it just sends a message to the table like, hey, I'm offline now, and it stays alive until uh, the game is over. So now uh, the player reconnects. We get a new connection handler process. This connection handler process does the authentication, like, hey, we are, uh, what's, uh, what user ID do you have? Send me your cookie and so on over the WebSocket. And then it knows I'm the connection handler for player number one. And it checks if the player number one process lives. And it does, so it says like, hi, I'm back. And the player process then looks at its state and knows for the current stage in the game, these were the events that are sent. And it first sends some fake events, like you are sitting at this table and these are the people that you are playing with and then it just sends all the events for the current stage that it had cached, and the player is back. Second part is uh, if you want to change active servers, as I said, for like deploying new versions of the code or because you need to reboot one of them. What we do is we have got our load balancer, and we can just point that at another active server. And we do that. That doesn't uh, affect connections to the, uh, to that are currently live and that are still connected to the old node and only new connections arrive at the new node. And we use the Erlang distribution protocol, that's, that's symbolized by that, uh, to uh, maintain state within those two servers that are basically both uh, doing stuff at this time. So there's this Erlang module RPC, it has this function multicall, 
you can give it another module and a function name and arguments, and it will call this module's function on all nodes within the cluster. So this is good. The, the old uh, active server knows, oh, that's no longer me. I need to go into standby mode. The standby server knows, oh, I now need to be active. So looking at the uh, old server, suppose there are like seven players playing. Uh, player one to four are playing at table number nine, and players five to seven are just in the lobby. What we can do is we can just kill players five to seven because they're in the lobby, they don't care. Uh, let's get rid of them. They will reconnect, arrive at the new server. Now, uh, table number nine is still going. Let's do some split view of like old server, new server. We start a table migrator process on the new server. This process monitors the table process on the old server. It monitors the players on the old server, and so it knows if they still uh, exist. I, I've removed some of those lines because they're cluttering stuff. Meanwhile, the web sockets from the people in the lobby reconnect, and their connection handler processes authenticate them, and then they check, uh, do we have a player process number five? No, we don't. Let's start one. And that happens for player six and player seven, and they're back in the lobby. So far, this is all awesome. But what happens when one of the players uh, playing at table number nine, who's still connected to the old node, dies? So uh, as I said, they get angry. They had hit F5. Their browser window reloads. WebSocket connection is gone. And player process and table process are still on the old node. But the new connection handler arrives at the new node. What happens is, it performs authentication as always. Then it looks, uh, where is the player number four process? Should I start one or should I reconnect? And it sees that there is a player number four process, but it's somewhere else in the cluster, because this is a global re registration, so it's uh, visible. And then uh, it starts a connection proxy process on the old server and just forwards it the raw data it gets, because that way we can just change how we deserialize and serialize JSON. And uh, if you're still playing on the old server, you get the old code that did that for you, and we don't have to keep compatibility between that. So uh, the WebSocket message arrives at the new connection handler. It just forwards the binary data to the connection proxy on the other node. That connection proxy pretends to be a WebSocket, deserializes the JSON, and forwards it to the player. So that way, uh, we still have like the guarantee that only one uh, player process per player exists in the cluster, but people can reconnect and then continue playing on their old server. So uh, back to the running game. Uh, let's forget about players five to seven. And suppose uh, table number nine now has finished their game. It's in the result stage. It displays this like uh, uh, player, uh, some player has one message. And usually it now would transition back to idle it would check there are still four people sitting at the table. If so, just restart the game. But because it knows it's going to be migrated, it doesn't do that. Instead, it, it uh, gathers the minimum amount of state it needs to be recreated somewhere else and sends that to the table migrator. So that looks like this. It's like a map with like table ID is this. These are the players. These are the positions at the table. These are the house rules that are active. This was the last game ID on, and so on. And then it just shuts down. And the player processes, similarly, see they are on the old node. They are no longer in a game. Let's just shut down too. And the connection handler processes do the same. So now there's only the table migrator left. Usually, the player now would see, uh, you've lost your connection, and everything would be dark, and we will reconnect you. But we obviously don't want that, because we want it to be seamless for the players. So what we did was, before we shut down on the old node, we sent a message over the WebSocket saying, you will be migrated. Don't display the connection loss dialog for the next 10 seconds. Instead, just reconnect. So the players just hang here for a second and don't notice anything. Now, uh, the connections arrive at the new node because the load balancer forwarded them there. They authenticate. Uh, so suppose player one was the first to re-authenticate. It then looks in a global ads table. Hey, I'm player one. Am I currently being migrated? If so, where to? And then it sees you're being migrated to table migrator nine. And it says to table migrator nine, hey. And the same happens to the other players. And once they're all there, the table migrator just uh, takes the portable state that was sent by the table on the old node and creates a new table with that. And that's it. 
it, uh, people seamlessly transitioned, and at this time we can shut down the old server and yeah. <laughs> so bolt poker. Bolt poker is way simpler and smaller than Sauspiel. It's like the perfect staging ground for new ideas. It, for example, doesn't need a database because you're just playing poker, we can hold all the state in memory, there are no user accounts or avatars or something. Uh, Sauspiel already uses Elixir for integration tests. So we write our new integration tests in Elixir. And we use Mix for building and dependency management because Mix is really, really awesome. So we want to look into using more Elixir code in production. So Bolt Poker. What we're going to do is we're going to rewrite all of Bolt Poker in Elixir, which is really awesome, and I'm looking forward to that very much. And why? Because uh, as Jose Valim said in his keynote, the extensibility goals of uh, Elixir are awesome and we want to leverage them. The standard library of Elixir is so much better than the standard library of Erlang. Erlang has accumulated this craft where uh, you don't know if, if when you use this module or that module, or, or if the subject you're working on is the first argument or the last. You don't know if indices start with one or zero. You have to look that up all the time. That's annoying. Elixir does away with that. This is great. Also mix. Mix is the best thing ever. The way it does dependency management, it's like Ruby's bundler, but way better because it has optional dependencies. That's what I learned yesterday. And, <laughs> and X unit, X unit is also great. It's like uh, there's E unit for Erlang. I don't like it as much as X unit. X unit is better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the business case for this is uh, Sauspiel is way bigger and more important than Bolt Poker. We want to use these technological advantages. Will we run into any issues? Let's find out by trying on Bolt Poker first. And one of the things I think that might be a bit annoying is that the Elixir standard library doesn't yet wrap all the important Erlang modules. Like it does wrap a uh, gen server, and it does wrap supervisor, and provides a really great DSL for that. But it doesn't wrap the gen FSM or ETS. So we'll probably end up using like alias ETS as ETS. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Another thing, uh, there's proper, which is an open source library that allows you to do property based testing. That's like if you know Haskell Quick Check or Erlang Quick Check. Erlang Quick Check is actually proprietary, and proper is open source. And so we use this, but it uses Erlang macros for like for all. And it's, it's, it's like 15 lines of macros. But we'll have to like port that to Elixir and maintain that. It's not much, but it has to be done. And I hope to open source that once it's done. And I hope that proper otherwise perfectly works with Elixir. And the other thing, when I was looking into the proprietary Erlang Quick Check, because Erlang Quick Check has pulls, which is kind of like ConQ error, which Jose Valim talked about today too, I noticed that pulls uses a, a uh, pass transform on your Erlang code to instrument it. And that pass transform is like bytecode, you can't edit it. So for example, if we were to use pulls, we couldn't migrate because we wouldn't get the pass transform. And maybe there are other libraries we want to use that do this, but I don't know of any, so I think not. And some lessons learned. I think performing encoding and decoding as far at the border of the system as possible is really great. It allows you to abstract it out. It's awesome. Creating your own behaviors, like we did for the nested finite state machine, allows you to like test them way easier because you've got your behavior that's like one small aspect, and you can just uh, send it the test data and figure out what it does. And it's not that hard to create your own callback modules. Just because like Chen Server and Chen FSM do it, don't be intimidated by that. It's easy. It's awesome. And Distributed Erlang makes so hard things so much easier. Like uh, reconnecting and forwarding that connection to the old node after it's authenticated and we know which player that actually is. With Erlang, it's easy. Yeah, uh, one more anecdote. So um, we, we were thinking about how to handle uh, our database when it gets downtime. And we've got this like data locality where all the information we need for a game is already in the Erlang uh, server. So what we did is if we want to persist something during the game, yet we can't because the database is currently down, uh, we just let the players finish their one game, then just dump the results that we would save on the disk and shut down this one table. And uh, 
we had some uh, really interesting experience with a kernel bug that uh, shut down our database, I think, twice. So this helped immensely. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? Uh, great talk. That was really nice to see the, the whole design. Uh, and I have a, a curiosity. What are the deliveries guarantees to the browser when you push the web socket? There is a chance that you send a message and the browser does not, not really going to receive it. Uh, so do you act back or things like that when you're pushing stuff to the browser? Um, so we use, we use TCP keep alive to ensure that we know that the web socket connection is open. And if it's gone, then, then we'll shut it down. And there are timeouts on the server, like if the client didn't reply with an answer for like which card to play, then uh, stuff happens like uh, in this case, we presume he's away from the keyboard and uh, after a pause, we like play automatically the next card according to our AI and so on. But we don't do like any real, like here's the thing, act it. Because if you reconnect, we just send you all the events that we know you need to restore your state anyhow. And that has worked. Oh yeah, uh, in the Elixir IRC channel, I was asked to write about how we use Mix to build our Erlang project. So I'm going to write about this, and I hope to have it online on Monday, and you can read about it. Uh, briefly, you mentioned how you're generating monotonic IDs um, with a single gen server. Uh, I was wondering how you uh, deal with that in a clustered environment. Like, is there a spe specific way you're able to ensure it's always monotonic throughout the entire cluster? So uh, the gen server talks to the Postgres database, and there's a sequence there. And this is the thing that actually generates the unique IDs. And the chance server just always gets like 50 of that and caches it. All right, thank you. Thank you.